So tonight, to draw the the official part of the course, if you like, to a close, we were planning to do um, these three things, considering how we might preach on texts from the Old Testament within the worship of the Christian church. And the first thing we're going to do is the sermon that you should have received by email. Um, we're going to give you opportunity to talk about how you respond to that and what's going on in that sermon. Then we're going to use some questions, which are also in the email, um, to help us review the course as a whole about the Old Testament. And then we might finish with a little bit looking at the basis of union of the Uniting Church and um, use that as, as the conclusion. Of course, um, as, I, as we mentioned last week, uh, Jason John is coming next week. And so we will have the bonus session on eco-theology next week, if you want to come back. But this is the, the, uh, the kind of drawing together the threads of the, the course that we've done thus far. So. <clears throat> so you were sent a sermon by my good self. I've called it the sacrifice of sense, um, and it is um, exploring the story of Isaac, but I've also put another story alongside it. And you, you had got some questions to think about, how I approached the text, what I said about it, how it was connected with contemporary life, and how the Old Testament provides a resource for our Christian faith. That might be a bit challenging, that last one with this particular sermon. So we're going to pop you into breakout rooms for about 10 minutes. And your task is to share with each other those particular questions or those points about um, the sermon. Uh, Dorothea, you've just come in and mucked up my breakout rooms. Right. <laughs> Hi, Janae. I'm oh, sorry. Well, welcome, Dorothea. It's nice to see you. That's right. <laughs> so rude. It's all right. Okay. <laughs> I can fix this. It's fine. All right. I'll move those person there before I open them. Good thing I checked. All right. Um, we're going to put you into rooms to discuss those things because we thought if you can share what and reflect on those um, particular points and what you thought about it, don't worry. My skin is tough. You can come back and tell me you thought it was not a good thing to do at all and tell me why. I'll probably defend it, but I won't be offended. And... Um, I'll, we'll see you in 10 minutes. So is everyone clear about their task? What insights would you like to share with me in the light of the um, questions? Well, our group found it um, quite thought-provoking and um, presented in such a way that you took away from it um, thoughts on what would I do? Or that's the way I felt about it. And I think our group was pretty much in that line. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Lorraine. And we thought it, um, it certainly led itself on to what's going on in our world at the moment. Yeah. Yes. We thought it was interesting that um, God intervene with Isaac no and apparently didn't with J Jfaf and didn't say well you know this is not a good idea to kill you off your own daughter um she had two months to grieve over it and all that and he still called off the own daughter rather than just saying well I really made a silly promise to you God do what you like with me but I'm not going to kill my own daughter it's uh, <laughs> very very disturbing it is very disturbing Indeed. Um, Derek, we missed what you said because you were talking at sorry, the same Derek. time as yes, David. I'm sorry, but uh, I said it was a very good illustration of Jesus saying, get your yes, yay be yay, and your nay be nay. It, it, you know, you can, for, for him to make that sort of promise, it wasn't even to God, really. It, it was just something he, he wanted to do, and he was stuck with it. To preserve yeah, his own honor. He felt he was stuck with it. Yes, that's right. Well, yeah. in the ancient world, you were stuck with it. If you made an oath like that, you were bound to keep it. And that's yeah, yeah. the way the ancient world operated. Right. Peter. I thought, I thought you reacted to it from your own postmodern sort of feminist point of view. <laughs> and 
<laughs> you surprised me, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> and, but I think that's probably pretty legitimate, you know, like to say, what's going on here, you know? But, and I think you sort of, it was pretty clear that you were, you were looking at it from, uh, you were acknowledging that they would have seen it in a different way, you know? Oh, yes, they would have. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, but if you're going to make something into the contemporary world, then you, you're going to make certain statements about it that might be different from just explaining it. Yes. The, the sermon that you've read is, um, that's its second sort of form. I, I did it quite some years ago now. It probably would have been at least seven or eight years ago now in Kempsey. And it was longer and it was more about explaining things. So it still had that postmodern feminist thing in it. That one was sharper and shorter. And I'd removed um, the son of Samuel, Jonathan, out of it because Jonathan is the third child that's saved, but he's saved by the people who okay. plead his case mm. um, and um, God spares him. But if you make an oath or you break certain, certain sacred things, it doesn't matter who you are, the wrath of God will come on you unless you follow certain processes either as uh, following the law where the people can appeal which they did with Jonathan and with Jephthah he's made an oath and he has to keep it mm. so um and what would happen if he didn't keep his oath they'd probably both end up dead well maybe you'd think that was a good thing I don't know but yeah and his daughter doesn't run away she knows the significance and the gravitas of making that sort of oath so right. she comes back yeah she doesn't just bolt for the hills with her maidens, which she could have done. Mm. And I, th I think we can probably agree that, that God would have looked after her anyway. One would hope so, but God has, does have a habit of smiting innocent things dead in the Old Testament. And we just have to accept, Derek, that that's what happens. Yeah. Because the child of David and Bathsheba, who is born as a result of their illegitimate union, is, is smitten by God and not in a good way. Um, he dies. And David pleads for his life and God says, no, nah, tough, you're being punished and the child dies and that's the punishment. So it's a very brutal world that we're dealing with. And don't mm. forget, we're dealing with a world full of sacrificial cults where right. animals are sacrificed on a regular and daily basis for different things. So this is, if you've read that God holds all life sacred in the Old Testament, you've read something where nobody has paid attention to what the Old Testament's actually saying. Right. Life is quite cheap, actually, in the Old Testament. And sacrifice of animals is, is um, a given. And making oaths and the punishment for breaking them or doing the wrong thing with them is generally swift and severe. And that's a different world that we're dealing with. <coughs> and it was David that was punished, not the child. Well, David is punished by the death of the child. So I'm not quite sure what you're going to say to that one, Derek. Uh, I, I think the child's the child's safe in God's hands. It, it, it's David that, that gets the gets oh, the lesson. No, come on, Derek. That's dodgy logic. I'm not sure the child would really <laughs> reckon on its death as being a good thing. Mm -hmm. And we don't hear Bathsheba's point of view. Well, How does she <laughs> feel about this? We only mm -hmm. hear David's voice in this. So again, if I was going to do David and Bathsheba, which I am for Project Reconnect to horrify or our rural mm -hmm. friends, that is the line I will be taking. <laughs> Because we don't hear Bathsheba's voice. It's all about David. Yeah, right. And that child dies. And don't say that's a good thing, Derek, because it's not a good I, thing. I didn't say it's a good thing. I'm just saying that I, I, I think we can, we can safely leave the child to God's hands. Maybe we can, but it's not a nice story. No, no, it isn't. <laughs> and David knew it and Nathan knew it. Oh, that's right. What else what we, um, um, might you want to say into this particular sermon? Uh, I just thought that um, uh, the hermeneutical spiral, the, the way you, um, uh, you assess the reading and um, personalise it, etc., sort of seemed to tie in with that hermeneutical spiral that we talked about. Mm. Oh, thank you, Maxine. And that's really good you went and looked back at that and applied it. So well done. <laughs> Uh, and it's certainly worth wondering what Isaac thought about the whole thing. 
Oh. I think so. I wanted mm. to tell part of this story from Isaac's point of view. The Jews call it the binding yes. of Isaac, which is much mm. more accurate than the okay. sacrifice of Isaac, which we tend to call it as Christians. He's not mm. sacrificed. He comes close. <gasps> if you can imagine what that child felt like being bound by his father, put on a, mm. a beer of sticks, which meant he was going to be burnt after the sacrifice, and seeing a knife lifted up above his throat, ready to come down and kill him, what would you mm. feel at that moment as that child? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really? Confused. This is confused. Completely terrified. 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 Absolutely terrified. terrified. Mm -hmm. This story course, would be in the Quran as well, wouldn't it? Yes. And yeah. of course, we don't hear um, Sarah's voice in this. What does no. Sarah think of all of this? And she, of course, yes. leaves straight after this. And her and Abraham are never together again. And you might infer um, after this that. She felt rather um, peeved, shall we say, at mm, Abraham's okay. actions of taking her only child away and ready to sacrifice him. Mm. So she, telling it from Isaac. That, was, was, was it just that he took it away? Did she know he was going to be sacrificed? No, no, she didn't. No. No. I'm, I'm making the assumption because Isaac glues himself to her and her tent till he's almost 40 before she dies and then he thinks about getting a wife and that she's not with Abraham at that time, I think we can infer from the story that the attempted sacrifice of Isaac has caused some domestic disruption, shall we say. Mm. <laughs> and we've probably got a child who's now going to be blessed with post-traumatic stress disorder for the rest of his life and never trust his father again. Right. You can, Im you can imagine the, the journey home and maybe Abraham says to Isaac, well, you probably don't need to mention this to your mother. I mean, it's a horrifying story on all counts, but um, and I, in my thinking, I think Abraham in many ways is just as foolish as Jeff Tar is, but it's a different way. Mm. Why would you just do that unquestioningly? why would you not say to God, why do you require this? Why mm. would you not talk to your wife about it? There's all sorts of things about this that isn't sitting well with me as far as I'm concerned. And I put Jephthah's daughter against the binding of Isaac because here we have quite similar situations in many ways and um, one child is saved and one is not. They're both innocent. Mm -hmm. And it's the unnamed female who is not saved. So I just thought it was an interesting comparison. You won't hear Jephthah's daughter's story told in the lectionary. So I was just making <laughs> sure that it was heard. Because too often women are subjected to violence, and that's the hermeneutic I lead into in the modern world. Um, and Jephthah's daughter's story. sorry, Jephthah's daughter's not in the, the line of Jesus, though. No, she's not. But nice. That's not the point. A lot of people aren't in the line of Jesus. Neither is Jonathan, you know, and we get a lot of mileage out of him. And Yeah. Mm. So it's, I think it's a patriarchal society, so it's saying something about that too. But, um, and it is a culture of sacrifice, but still to take your only child that you've waited for for so many years that is meant to be the promise of nations, the first thing I would have said as Abraham would be, you told me I would be father of many nations through this child. And now you're saying I'm going to take him up a mountain and end his life. Would you care to explain your reasoning behind this? That would be my first question. God would say, no. <laughs> How dare you talk back to me? <laughs> yeah, so. And it wouldn't be as exciting a story, but I do feel that the other thing that we miss <coughs> is that the honour of Jephthah's daughter mm -hmm. in going off for her two months to mourn and then she comes back to present herself to be sacrificed, the courage that she shows is actually one that you could say models far more than the binding of Isaac, the crucifixion, because often the binding of Isaac is presented as a, a kind of crucifixion pointing story about the mm. sacrifice of innocence. And here we have in Jephthah's daughter, the real sacrifice of innocence and a mm. courage that actually voluntarily brought her back and said to her father, do what you have to do. Mm. And that's yeah. not mentioned anywhere. 
and I thought yeah. this was a, an injustice. So that's one of the reasons I picked it up because I feel people should know this story. Yes. Mm. Yes, it's not, it's not a story you often hear in, in a sermon, though, is it? No. no. But then again, Derek, I preach those kinds of sermons. Yes, you can ask yes. the tiger and old people. <laughs> they often hear things that they probably wouldn't hear in normal sermons. Uh, don't worry, I've heard it in the Anglican Church. Excellent. That's what we like to hear, Janice, that it's, it's a widespread, or at least it's not just me. Any other comments that people want to make about it? The, 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 there's just one, just one comment that both stories are told in, in, in their plain, plain English text sort of thing as we read it. Uh, they're not hidden, they're not the, 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 the neither of the uh, people are excused or so on. It's, it, it, you know, what, why would you put this thing, why would you put a story in like that, really, if it didn't happen? Well, that's a good point, yeah. I think, Derek. And I think the uglier and nastier it is, the more likely it is it probably did happen. So I'm not suggesting that this is necessarily a mythology at all. No, no. Um, because why would you put that in? Mm -hmm. It's probably based on something. And people made these promises back in these days. Yeah, this yeah. is a different world and a different culture. Where, and he may, Jeff Tarn may well have thought his favourite hunting dog would run out to meet him. Because <laughs> that would have been a common thing. And he yeah. may have thought in making this oath that that's what would happen. What he didn't expect was his daughter yeah. coming out. Yeah. 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 And that's, yeah. I mean, if you gamble like that, there's always the risk it's going to go horribly wrong. Mm. I've got a question along the line of, uh, there's often a Christian argument that God sacrificed his only son uh, for our welfare. So yes. that's another one of these uh, father sacrificing son stories yes. that uh, gets trotted out quite a lot. Yes, yes. and that's why it's, it's often linked with the Abraham story, <laughs> where, yeah. where a closer version is actually the Jephthah's daughter, because she is sacrificed. So um, John and I have actually written yeah. about this. We've got a paper on violence in the Bible where um, it's, a it's a dialogue. You haven't heard it. But I am a horrified Gentile at the idea that any father could sacrifice their son so cruelly. And, mm. and John, as a Jewish Christian, is trying to sell me the concept. So um, it's something that we have contemplated. Mm. Can I ask, um, do you think, would Abraham have been able to reason that God raises the dead? Because he says that he, um, they will return. We will return. So do you think he would have... Would he have had that kind of understanding or faith at that time? No, because God didn't raise the dead in the Old Testament. No, it happened a couple of times no. with prophets. Elijah and Elisha are both credited with that, but I think they're the only instances we hear of. It's not mm. a common thing. Yeah. If he was banking on that, it would I would be surprised because there's nothing in Genesis in any of the stories that indicate God raises the dead. No, no. Any other comments or questions you want to make? Elizabeth, how old would Isaac have been? Um, that's despite that, that there's a bit of dispute around that. He's probably come of age, so maybe around 13. Okay, so he carried all the wood. Yeah, he carried the wood, that's yeah. right. And to find himself put on it. Um yeah. I don't know the age makes quite sense because Abraham's probably 110 by now, <laughs> something like that. Um, one would think that a, um, an adolescent male could wrestle his aged father to the ground, but apparently not. He gets bound and put on the beer and there he is. Yeah. And the child is asking, where is the sacrifice? It's not oh. like he's expecting it to be himself because no. he, he asks where the animal is. Oh. But they're both deeply disturbing stories. Yeah, it's yeah. connected for slightly yeah. different reasons. And I don't <clears> mind <throat> preaching on stuff like that from time to time because every now and again I get sick of hearing about women being killed by their intimate partners. 
and you know if at that time I'm upset about it and this Isaac's the binding of Isaac hoves into the lectionary then that's it I'm on to it (laughs) (laughs) to talk about that because we've got a plague of children committing suicide we've got all these stories of abuse that have come out of our church institutions we have more than one woman a week being killed by her intimate partner, sometimes in most horrific ways. And one has to ask, you know, when's that going to stop? So preaching into that space seemed to me a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. Hmm. Well, okay then, if we have run out of comments, we'll move to the next section. In the email that uh, I sent you um, <clears throat> were these questions for you to think back over the course and to think about what parts of the Old Testament that we've looked at might have surprised you, what parts you've found are helpful for your Christian faith, whether there are sections that confront you or leave you with questions or doubts to explore further and whether you just feel that there are some parts that we've looked at or some parts that are in the Old Testament that are irrelevant in terms of Christian faith. So we're going to give you the opportunity to talk about those questions with one another once more, and then we'll come back and do some more sharing about that. Okay. Does everyone know what they're doing? Yep. Yep. Okay. I'll open your breakout rooms again. So we've been thinking about the course, um, and we, I want to direct your attention now to page 124, um, to some of the things that are said about the Bible as a whole in the basis of union. And, um, maybe what we'll do, um, Elizabeth, is we might use groups again. We've got time to spend a, uh, a bit on each of these sections. Is that okay? You, she hasn't disappeared. Sorry. Yes, that's fine. Um, yeah. So how much time do you want for I'll section? Let me introduce paragraph five and then we'll do five minutes on that. Okay. Um, so paragraph five talks about both Old and New Testaments. It describes them as unique prophetic and apostolic testimony. It might be easy to kind of connect prophetic with the Old Testament and apostolic with the New Testament, but the basis doesn't actually divide it up like that. It says that we've received the books and in those books, we hear the word of God. Um, It says that when we hear the word of God, our faith, faith and obedience are nourished and regulated. And then when the church preaches Jesus Christ, its message is controlled by the biblical witnesses. So there's some interesting verbs that are used in that section of that paragraph, I think, that scripture nourishes, regulates, and controls. And each of those verbs have a different kind of connotation involved in them. And I think the other thing which I'll leave for you to tease around, talk around in your discussion is the relationship between the word of God and the Bible, because this paragraph says the word of God on whom salvation depends is to be heard and known from scripture when it is appropriated in the worshipping and witnessing life of the church. So what is that saying about the relationship between the word of God and the Bible? And what role do human beings have in um, making that assessment of the Bible? So can we have a look at those three questions in our groups and and perhaps um, just respond to those uh, for a few minutes, please? Okay. (coughs) Are we all clear what we're doing? No. (coughs) Just the first three questions on that page. Okay. Okay. Did anyone look at question three? Didn't get that far. Um, it it's might asking. Have come in, in, it uh, might have come up with it though. Yeah, it's asking about the relationship between the Word of God and the mm. Bible. And one of the things yeah. about the basis of union is it doesn't actually say the Bible is the Word of God. Yeah. yeah. And that, of course, was one of the points of contention around the time leading up to the formation okay. of the United Church. Mm. But it talks That's about. That's what we the, talked about in our group. We talked um, about the Word of God being Jesus Christ and the Bible yep. being a book. The yes. points to Jesus and yes. points to yeah. the Word of God, but not being the Word of God. Yeah. Our group talked about that. Mm. Oh. 
Agreed. Right. Yeah. It's very dangerous to say the Bible is the word of God. Like I, my biggest, the most glaring thing for me is the, the, uh, the people who had investments in the slave trade in the 1800s in England used to say, slaves, obey your masters. There it is. God has spoken. God, mm -hmm. slavery is ordained by God. Yeah. This is the word mm -hmm. of God. This proves it. That's people right. can do that. It's a really dangerous thing to, to do, to, to just literally say the Bible is the word of God. You can do anything for that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And people yes. have. And people have, and people still do. Yeah. 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 Mm. And the Bible has become weaponized in mm. traditions against minorities oh. or against women <laughs> or against um, different groups of people who don't fit what would be seen as, you know, the norms that yeah. we, as we call them in society. It's interesting how some people will say this is the word of, of God, therefore we've got to do this, but ignore another passage. That's yeah. right. Contradict yeah. it or say it differently. Yes. You, you see Bible-based churches, they call them, people call themselves Bible-based churches. They're not Bible-based churches. They don't look at the whole Bible. They don't use the lectionary. They just pick the bits that suit them and hammer them. They do. That's right, yes. Peter. Yeah. And I feel that my preaching is incredibly Bible-based. If we're going to talk about Bible-based, you know, they're welcome to come to Tuggers anytime and they'll find me preaching on the Bible and exegeting it and talking about it in its context, as my congregation will assure you, I do most weeks. Yeah. yeah. Every now and again, I do a pastoral sermon with a story just to prove I can, but that'd be once a year. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love the stories. <laughs> See, but I'm not sure if you do this in your church, but in our church, every time we read the Bible, at the end of the Bible reading, we will say, this is the word of our God. Yeah. So this yeah. is the word of God. Yeah. So, so we don't say that anymore. We say in our church, in this is the word of the Lord. In mm -hmm. this, which okay. is come from this part of the basis of union where it says that the word of God can be found in it. Mm -hmm. So in right. this, and some other churches say for the word of the Lord. Um, so there's various ways you can express it without saying this is the word of God yeah. or this is the word of the yeah. Lord. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and the issue that Peter was talking about, about how we understand the Bible in the light of our own understanding of contemporary society and, and reality today, um, that's actually picked up in paragraph 11, which is one of my favourite parts of the basis of union, um, which you can find on page 124. The Uniting Church acknowledges that God has never left the church without faithful and scholarly interpreters of scripture yeah, or without those yeah. who've reflected deeply upon and acted trustingly in obedience to God's living word. So it's not just a matter of scholarly interpretation, but it's about personal reflection and personal action in response to, mm. in obedience to the word. Mm. And um, then it goes on to talk about um, uh, contemporary uh, modes of knowledge and inquiry um, contemporary thought and contemporary societies and says that we need we we engage with all of these as we read the bible and um in that sentence about um giving thanks for the knowledge of god's ways of humanity which are open to an informed faith it actually identifies the kind of things that we've been doing in this course in terms of literary, historical, and scientific inquiry, because we've certainly looked at different parts of the Bible as different literary genres, different literary styles. And we've thought about historical questions and, and we have a particular um, understanding of history and how history is, is um, reported and how history is assessed. And there's also stuff to think about in terms of science. And we've had a lot, have had, um, developments in scientific understanding over the last number of centuries. Um, I suppose the classic example of that is that thinking scientifically, we, we look at Genesis 1 and we give a, a literary interpretation. We say this is a, um, a story that is told. This isn't a scientific explanation about what is happening. And we, we treat it as literature in which day doesn't mean 24 hours, but day is like 
um, an epoch or an era or a period in time. Mm. Um, so we we bring our own um, understandings of the world today into contact with the uh, with the uh, the Bible, and similarly we live with the worldwide fellowship of churches and um, engage with contemporary thinking, and we are in societies that help us to understand our own nature and mission. So um, the, this this paragraph really encourages to do us to do what. Elizabeth and I hope we have been doing in this course, which is um, to thank God for the continuing witness and service of evangelist, scholar, prophet and martyr, and pray that we as the church may be ready when occasion demands to confess the Lord in fresh words and deeds. Um, And as we've seen, it's not just a matter of opening the page, reading it and saying, well, there you go. Um, but actually of engaging with it, thinking about it, exploring it, interpreting it. Um, And that creates the fresh words and deeds that we generate every time we preach. We are doing something fresh in terms of uh, interacting with that text and bringing it to the people that we're we're preaching to. Um, So maybe we should look at question three in this section. What sort of fresh words and deeds now seem necessary to you? What place do the church's traditional creeds and catechisms now play? How do they relate to social action in contemporary society? Going from the Bible to other parts of our faith. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? I think the, um, the creeds and traditions remind us of, you know, that we are a community and that we need to mm. reinforce those creeds every so often to remind us that, you know, we're not just one person, we're part of a group. It's a we, not a me, yeah. Mm. Yeah. And back in paragraph five, I think it makes it quite clear that interpreting and understanding the Bible isn't just an individual thing. It's actually a community. Yeah. Yeah. The word of God on whom salvation depends is to be heard and known from scripture appropriated in the worship of the Bible. It's something that we're together. Worship. I remember um, some years ago uh, talking to a minister after he had preached a particular message which I didn't quite agree with and his explanation when I challenged you know what it was all about he said well what I present are my thoughts for you to think about and you might come up with a Mm. different idea and that made me listen to people differently right And I think something very simple, like I did today, I had to, uh, my gardener come to help me out and we often sit down and chat. And he was asking me, what are you doing on Sunday? So I told him about the story of Samuel <laughs> that I'm going to be preaching on. And then I explained the story of Samuel to him and we had a conversation about it. And he sort of said, oh, nobody's ever talked to me like that. It's just in ordinary conversation, you weave things in. Mm. I didn't try and convert him or do anything. I just told him what I was doing. Mm. And, and he gained from that. <laughs> mm. I, was, I was talking to a friend a couple of weeks ago, and we're talking about some, some spiritual thing that he was going through. And I said, I said, there's a, there's a book about that. There's a book about that. There's a book. And I was trying to remember the title of some book that I'd read, you know, and he said, the Bible? <laughs> <laughs> right, yes. Well, this, this, this Sunday is Trinity Sunday. Yes. And I, I'm having to do the sermon at, 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 at uh, Alpine here. And, you know, it was 350 years before the church wrote it down that, that the Trinity, that, that, that there was such a thing as a Trinity. 385, 385. Uh, uh, yeah. Was it Constantinople or somewhere? Yes. Yeah. Right. yeah. 
it, it took them it took their, they took their time i mean the the, the theme is there the, th the theme is there the old testament as well if you look for it yeah but, but it's it, it it took them 350 years to actually formulate it which is interesting okay yeah, yeah. yes and that's I a think very the, um that God is a relationship is a very exciting thing for me. That, uh, that yeah. goes a lot into my thinking at the moment. Yeah, sorry. Damien, did uh, you want to say the something? The paragraphs um, kind of remind us and emphasise the importance of a posture of humility. Um, yes. Open learning, um, a recognition that, you know, we, we um, are in the stream of history, we're in the context of, you know, culture and society and that, just as we are to hear the word of God through scripture, we're also able to hear the word of God um, expressed in other places, in other ways, you know, Christ is revealed in different ways in addition to scripture, um, you know, through society and through scholarly, you know, inside and the voice of the prophets and um, the creativity of culture and all of these things we can we can gain yes. and learn yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, how, how many how many of us actually uh the, the many of our churches follow the recommended lectionary do do, 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 do is this fairly normal yes yes it really? is in the uniting church it, we have one church um in wagga that doesn't necessarily follow the lectionary and one that does. So people have that <laughs> choice of looking at things contemporarily or looking at them through the lectionary. Yes, because, because you know, the, the, the Anglicans do the same. They, they use the same lectionary. The Catholics oh. use the same lectionary yeah. in, in our yeah. part of the world. Yeah. Yes, the lectionary was created by the Catholic Church, yes. and yes. it's called the Revised Common Lectionary because it became a common lectionary, not just, just Catholic, yeah. but shared yeah. with Anglicans mm -hmm. and other Protestants, and then yeah. it was revised. Because, because we, we used to go to, we used to, go to the, the, the service up, up at Threadbow on the jazz weekends and the blues weekends, and Father Peter's sermon was always it was short, short sermon, was always the same as the what we had down and uh, what we got down in in Jinwan. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, yes. the lectionary has some mis um, some failings, but it also has some advantages, especially if churches take the effort to actually like read the Old Testament reading, even if you're not preaching on it, because mm -hmm. it does take you through parts of the great narratives and the Torah and the prophets that you may not otherwise read. So mm -hmm. at least you get to hear some of the, the stories and the narratives um, and the mm -hmm. prophecies from the Old Testament if you follow it. So that's partly its aim. It's, it, it is quite often difficult to connect the four readings, though. You sometimes they connect, connect very well, but sometimes no. you get to think, now what was that all about? You know? Yeah, some, <laughs> some seasons of the year, the four are deliberately chosen yeah, to relate yeah. to one another. Yeah, but yeah. And other times, after Trinity, when we start into that long period after Pentecost, That's right. the Old Testament just goes on its merry way and the, the gospel goes on its merry way. Mm, mm, mm. That is yeah. not really uh, meant to be necessarily connected. Sometimes they, you can pick up some kind of resonance, but not necessarily. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I mean, they connect on high days like Easter and um, through seasons like Lent and Advent, you'll find connections yeah. that are deliberate, but most of the year it's not it's kind of random but it's meant for you to follow stories you wouldn't otherwise read but this yeah. year in mark we'll hear the wisdom literature this is the only time it comes onto the lectionary yeah but one of the good things about the lectionary in terms of this course is that it actually every every sunday it offers two passages from the old testament as well as two passages from the New Testament. Yes, mm. so you have a gospel and you have a letter usually, or sometimes acts, but then you have uh, an Old Testament section and you have a psalm. So yeah. it actually invites us to think about the whole of the Bible, not just our favourite part or the, yeah. the designated mm. the, the track we're following. Uh, and and, and in, in Jinnabon, where we have a number of... Um, Amateur lay preachers, if you can call it, call it, call us this. Um, 
it, it does it does help you focus focus your thoughts yes yeah, yeah right. it does yeah it does <laughs> Yeah, and you're not um, bound to it. If there is a special day, like a World Environment Day or something like that, that you particularly want to celebrate and worship, you're not yeah. bound to the lecture. It's got yeah. all three. Yeah. Well, I think we're probably drawing close to um, our time. And <coughs> um, just to um, remind you that... Um, as we leave the course, hopefully you found parts that have been surprising and parts that have been helpful, as well as questions that um, carry on for you to explore. <clears throat> um, I've um, been working over the last few weeks on a series of blogs, which um, are kind of my, picking up some of the things we've been doing and my attempt to draw things together. So. I'll be sending an email out. They'll have a link to those um, blogs, which you may wish to read subsequently. Um, as you've been doing your own thinking, I'll add my thoughts into that. Um, a reminder that next week we have the bonus session on eco-theology and the Reverend Dr. Jason John will be with us from Bellingen to think about eco-theology in the Old Testament. <clears throat> And I think that Rowan will, Rowan England from UME will be sending you an evaluation form by email at some point fairly soon. So I encourage you to fill that out and get that back. We, Elizabeth and I get to see the collated responses, with, they're de-identified, so we don't know who says what. So go for your life and say what you want. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> And for those of you that have that are still waiting on work from the New Testament, I'll have some time on Thursdays, hopefully, to um, put my head into that and, and get that back to the Old, uh, Old Testament. All right, folks. Well, um, hopefully, we'll, we'll see a number of you next week. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, okay, yes, definitely. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Good luck, everyone. Good week.